after this introduction, thanks for being here actually, and I decided to kind of give the overview of a field of quantum optics and solid the way I see it and what brought me to finally start growing indium islands inside of my MD machine looking for something new. So the first step is kind of a little bit of prehistory is uh, in 2004, it was a funny coincidence of having three kind of major works of seeing cavity QED as effectively vacuum rubby splitting in semiconductor, and it was our work in photonic crystal. It was work in Germany with the micropillars, and it was at the same time was published a work of superconducting crowd seeing also vacuum rubby splitting. And this is the beginning of a rather sad story because pretty much superconducting crowd took us out of business. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, you'll see the next PowerPoint, it's effectively all of us normal cavity QED people with the quantum dot or with atomic was seeing a vacuum rubber splitting which is pretty much barely, you know, it's resolvable but it's no way you can climb James Cumming ladder and do a wonderful interesting thing which happens in a superconductivity. And you know, it was a kind of 10 years, sorry. You know, it's 11 years later, it was a lot of work happening with both photonic crystal and vertical cavity and they're going into application, but the real superconducting stuff, I mean the real cavity QED stuff is done in superconductivity. It's a very curious kind of development of the field that, okay, quantum dots didn't go anywhere. And you know, one of the reasons is that it's, uh, we cannot get Q of a cavity, of our cavity high enough to see the splitting. That was a basic showstopper. Another showstopper was that, okay, we see one good dot, we find one good dot, we do experiment on one good dot. A lot of people was putting a lot of money trying to say, okay, maybe for application as a gate, we can learn how to position a bunch of the dots and getting, you know, it was the beginning, the advertisement was saying, you know, it's a gate on a chip and stuff like that. After 10 years of investing tons of money of learning how to grow do good individual dots, you still, I mean, you can get a good picture, but the luminescence is still lousy. Somehow Mother Nature do not like to put good dots on pre-aged substrates. And you know, it was work done in this country, in Germany, and we work and you know, it basically failed attempts. So I guess in my view, it's pretty much, I do not see where quantum dots really going anywhere now. It was still, you know, it's some nice experiments, but it's still just one dot. And in terms of physics, one dot is still behaves like an atom. So it's uh, not great for fundamental, but in terms of applications, it's also, you know, it's, it's basically stopped because you cannot get more than one dot identical. So. But amazingly enough, the cavity part of the, our photonic crystal seems to become a big field in the atomic physics. And this cover is stolen from Jeff Kimball, who just succeeded of making cover of nature photonics. And it's May of this year, effectively putting cold atom in photonic crystal. So it's kind of a curious development of the way semiconductor or solid state affected atomic physics, cavity QED or fundamental atomic physics is that people begin to use photonic crystals as a semi as a effectively cavity. And one of the reason because they have a very, very small volume. So this is a gas photonic crystal slab nanocavity. And that's the one we was using, which is 1,500 nanometer. It's made out of dielectric and one of the kind of success of this cavity early on, and I could say that, of course, it was Amnon Uriv and Axel Scheer and Kraut in 2000 to first make a laser out of this photonic crystal cavity with the quantum well, and then we jumped in saying, oh my God, this is a cavity with the smallest volume, so let's drill hole and use it, because before we was clearly trying to do it in a planar cavity. So you know, but for, for a decade, we was all doing drill baby drill, as effectively drilling holes and see can we improve the Q but still, so far in gallium arsenide, Q is stuck at you know, 20,000. It's kind of a record sample. They have order of magnitude better in silicon. Nobody can understand why, but silicon is much more forgiving material. But, okay, so this is kind of end of at least my cavity, photonic crystal cavity story. But then the next level of intelligence was to say, okay, if we cannot improve Q of our cavity, maybe we can do something curious with cavity QED if we'll go to a smaller volume. And try to couple instead of the dielectric cavity, if we can have a resonance, we can have a metallic cavity. 
uh, which is effectively a silver dipole antenna, the volume of this cavity will be 1,000 times smaller. Of, of course, Q will be 10 or even worse, but you can argue that having a very bad Q will be very good and very interesting if you want to couple more than one dot. If you want to couple several dots and being a so-called Dickey regime, you could be very good of having, a, you know, if you have a volume 1,000 times smaller, it means that your field, vacuum field, will be one over square root of this volume. So it will be much, much bigger than anything you can get in this cavity. And at the meantime, it's curious that we was kind of a parasite on uh, semiconductor technology developing photonic crystals for the our cavity QED. And here we became a parasite of the field, emerging field of metamaterial, where people was learning how to fabricate small metallic nanostructures. And this was, so we started working effectively with the probably best person in that field is Martin Wegener in Germany, and a good friend of mine. And the first step started putting, at the beginning, just quantum well and see if we can now couple this metallic resonator to the cavity and see the cell effect and effectively start doing cavity QED, but with much, much smaller volume. And in the meantime, this is a graph which shows that you can tune the resonance of this silver split ring resonator by basically changing, not showing the change in the size here, but you can tune it to be in resonance with your, with your gain medium. And at the same time, it was, I was interested in Purcell effect. And of course, I should remind you that the Purcell original paper was actually coupling to the metallic cavity. So we kind of went all the way back and say, now we can tune our metallic cavity to be in resonance with our structure. And we can grow a quantum well or layer of quantum dots underneath and try to couple. And our volume will be 10 times, 1,000 times smaller than anything in a photonic crystal cavity. So it could be a interesting regime. And at the same time, we were selling the story for getting the money is so not only cavity QED, but in principle, all this great field of metamaterial and becoming invisible and all of this stuff, which is also consists of making this metallic resonator, have one huge problem that metal is a huge absorber. And if you only have any chance of doing anything, you better put gain. You better couple gain into your material. So we did also learn that we can fabricate all possible silver antennas on top in resonance and see the coupling. And but it was a slightly sad part of the story now that all coupling was, I mean, it's polarization sensitive because it depends on which way you excite the system, but all coupling was pretty small. It's about like 5% and delta T goes negative, which is basically means if you think about it, two harmonic oscillator, one is your cavity, is your metallic cavity and one is your quantum well, that overall transmission gets even more negative when you put a huge gain into the system. So this is what we was calling it anti-laser, that usually the quantum well, if you surround it with the, with the normal dielectric cavity, it's a pixel, it's a vertical cavity surface emitting laser, it will laser like crazy. If you put metallic cavity, you see a very interesting dependence, and this is a dependence on tuning. So this clearly shows that when we have our, okay, I'm gonna, it was, sorry, it was this picture of effectively when we tune our resonance into the sink, we'll have increased coupling. And it's, uh, and we can explain it in terms of a toy model. And so it worked, it coupled, but it's a, it's a very small effect. And another big drawback, because remember originally we wanted to couple single dot or several dots to this metallic resonator, is a very big killer was the fact that the coupling goes down if you get closer. So you, uh, Sorry, you need to be very close to see the coupling. So it goes down when you're about like 40 nanometers, you don't see anything. And this is a kind of a cooking problem of being able to grow a good single quantum dot close to the surface, pretty much 20 nanometers. When you get closer than 20 nanometers, the individual line of a quantum dots disappear. So we then start thinking, okay, now what, <laughs> what, do, we do, what do we do? What's next? And instead of working, with silver, I did have a prolonged time obsession to see can we grow this metallic structure on top of our quantum well or quantum dots inside of the same chamber. And basically, in our MBE, sorry, in our MBE chamber, we have arsenic, and then we have aluminum, gallium, indium. 
So you know, we usually go in gas, gas, any combination of these two, but also you know, the idea was can we grow semiconductor first and then grow metal on top without doing the fabrication step of putting the, because you know, to make the silver structure you need to use PMMA, you need to write the E-beam, then you have to put it in a different oven to deposit rather shit the quality of silver compared to in principle here, if we learned how to grow the small structure, it's some ch chance that we can then bury them with the quantum dot, you know, we can get much closer to it. So that was kind of original idea, but then at the same time I was actually beginning to infect it by Majorana disease and <laughs> start curious about superconducting and putting semiconductor very close to superconductor to play with the Andreev reflection and stuff like that. And then of course realize that both indium and aluminum is superconductors if you cool them well enough. And for my choice, indium was even more interesting because it's very easy to grow. As I'll show you later, you can make a very nice nanostructures out of indium. So this was our first attempt actually to grow indium island was last year and uh, this is our first sample look like so this is indium islands and effectively what we did is a very simple thing we grew gallium arsenide traditionally and then we close arsenic and we cool the temperature of the substrate to about 120 degrees and again I'm cooking my second life so usually you grow gas at about 580 Celsius, you know, you have pretty high. But you know, so you basically use your MBE machine to first grow semiconductors, then you pretend that now I have a metal growing chamber, you get rid of arsenic, and you start playing with the growth rate. So our first sample was actually amazingly successful. We ended up getting islands, and we even was able to measure its wavelengths, and it was kind of one of the curious mysteries, which we explained later, that it was all about the same size, and it's actually, you know, it's a very nice growth, uh, lifted less of distribution of growth where the big thief is small thief and the average size is increasing. So we actually measure statistics and seeing some of these cases we have the flat. What's behind that? Why, why is it so wonderful? Well, it's a, so far it's a big hope that I have a clean interface, that in principle I have the cleanest possible interface of having semiconductor which can emit light and in my particular case, it will be indium arsenide wires and superconductor which sit on top of it. So I have the cleanest system to look for photon emission from a semiconductor under the influence of superconductor. Well, but what I'm wondering is why are the islands all nearly the same size? You, uh, you, know, the you might have expected there to some kind of a plus or minus distribution. That's clearly well, this is a good, I mean, I, 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 in two PowerPoints, I'll show you why. I mean, we, we still don't understand the difference between two machines, but it is a, I mean, this is a PL, basically showing that under, uh, just give me two more points, I'll show you the PowerPoint. It's a very good question, and we have powerful answer. Why is it being eaten? So we do see the increase in PL underneath of the islands when we grow the dots. And as usual, we saw we was not the first people who did the small dot, the small islands but they never measure the distribution. So we're the first one to measure the distribution. And it's, uh, I mean, let me actually go straight to this PowerPoint. Okay, so this is a, and I'll come back. So this is a distribution we did for in our machine. So we did it 1,700 islands. And it is for Asonian in our machine, in our MD machine. Then we did this, in a French machine, which is a very different design, which is a huge flat surface. Uh, I mean, this is kind of $4 million machine, and they do have a different distribution. They pick up this tail. So <laughs> the tail is, a, and the tail is, this is my <laughs> leaf, it's less of growth flow. I wanted to get into it, and it's basically, it's a beautiful physics, and if you have a n number of particles, you write a, EN, so is a uh, loss rate. I mean, it's all in energy consideration. So, you know, assume your indium island hanging, you know, you indi your indium, indium, indium atom, actually, and you are being at a very slow rate deposited on a surface of gallium arsenide. And, you know, Mother Nature wants to minimize the energy. So you're looking for a place to stick in and you start moving around. And I mean, one thing we're doing absolutely new here is our growth rate is one, uh, 
one monolayer, which is 2.8 angstrom per hour. Usually growth rate is 2.8 angstrom per second of gallium arsenide. So we give this, you know, this indium atom all the time to wander around, you know, what to do with himself. And it looks like if you write the law of the, you know, total number of particles you know, in the particular island, they can, you know, if you have all this time in the world to do stuff, you can, you know, some atoms will be, you know, let's look at one island, they will be going away from it, and some new atoms will be sticking in. So if you write the law of basically gain rate and minus loss rate, you will see that for the 3D structure, you have T to one third law. And if you, I mean, it's basically it's a lifted flesh of distribution, and it was first actually observed, not by us, but it was people who was first doing quantum dust in glass. It was a group in St. Petersburg, and they was trying to, it, at Yoffa Institute, they was trying to get as clean fiber as possible for military purpose. And they was not succeeding of getting very clean fiber, they was always seeing some bumps. And then they were trying to figure out where the bumps come from, and it was Alexei Eproth, who is actually now at Navy Research Lab, who explained it, saying that the bumps come from the point that just very little of semiconductor, which you have in your glass, forms this quantum structure by Lifford's less of distribution. Because of it, and because again, it's an example is that the big fifth want to eat small fifth, and the over all size is gradually increasing. Well, this is kind of traditional picture. You know, the, the richer are getting richer, and the small one disappear because they're, because of this low rate, they're just giving up their atoms, and they're not gaining from the surface. As, as, I mean, it's a very deep physics. I mean, it was Stephen Koch wrote like kind of whole chapter explaining a very deep mathematics underneath of it. But this is a very simple version of mathematics. It's basically the competition of growth rate and loss rate, and the winner take it all. And for, so, so for three D, it's T to one third, but it's how the real quantum dust was discovered because it just because it was this distribution, people was able to observe the bump, and then they did the Landau, you know, the quantization particle in the box, and figure out that it's indeed a quantum dust in glass, and that was the original work in '86. That before people start growing them by MBE. But it is, so in some sense, we repeated it, and we kind of knew that indium arsenide island dust also grows that way, that you do have a distribution. So in that sense, indium just repeated, but again, we was not expecting to see the structure, so let me just now. And, but again, the mystery we have, this is our machine, and our substrate is hanging that way. You know, this is a traditional Riberian B machine, which is 25 years old, and back. But it's only in Toulouse we got the tail. So in Toulouse we got the tail in our machine, amazingly enough, it's a narrow distribution. So my good story, my explanation is that big fish want to eat small fish only when the substrate is flat, is horizontal. So the gravity is not playing the role. In our case, when we're hanging at the angle, the gravity is messing it up. But what we don't understand, our distribution is slightly narrow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't have the, I mean, the only explanation we, I have, it's why I brought the piece. So this is the reverb machine. So all the cells are from the bottom. And this is, they have a huge wafer, which you can put three big, big molly blocks. And it's all, you know, this is the latest high tech. The reason it's cost $4 million, because people want to grow very uniform <laughs> pixel, vertical cavity emission laser and everything very uniform. So they invest. 25 years of technology and the uniformity of their huge substrate. In our case, being a fundamental scientist, we have this tiny chamber and we have a tiny small uh, vapor and we usually use just a quarter of it because they are so dumb expensive. <laughs> and then, then so our vapor is at the angle. That's the only difference between the two. What about, is there no difference in, say, cleanliness? Uh, cleanliness is the same. No, we, we, we did check our vacuum and we did, we have, we grew a couple of test samples. We grew indium arsenide dot sample and so the same PL line. And it's, uh, but again, I mean, they're probably cleaner in a big thing. So it's, uh, but our vacuum was very similar. It was 10 to the minus 10. I mean, it was pretty good vacuum. We, we baked the machine and our test PL samples. But I mean, I, I don't know the answer why we do not see the tail. 
Yes, we repeated actually, no, this, we absolutely repeated the growth parameters. Yes, this was for 834 angstrom. I mean, in all our samples, I mean, the range always got the tail, and we was. Well, I think you only get really good. You only get big size if you give time for atoms to find the home. If you go at one among layers per hour. If you grow at a faster time, you have, you know, your size is all about much, much smaller. So it's more, it hurts. Oops, sorry, going the wrong way. If you give a small amount of time, it basically is what we was doing at the beginning before. If you change with the traditional growth rate, which is about 0.2 manga layer per second to 0.07 manga layer per second, we change the density and the peak is changing, but the distribution here is pretty shitty. It's, I mean, we can still see it, it's a resonance, but it doesn't, I mean, the distribution, I mean, in, in French machine, it was our breakthrough where we gave all the time and it's where we saw the tail and then we rep reproduced it in our machine without the tail. But here it was just changing the density, but the size of the dust was not changing if we were changing with the growth parameters. So it's kind of at the beginning, interesting, because at the beginning it looks like if you don't give them enough time, you just change the, you know, at indium nine, you know, you just change the density of the guys, but you do not flip the peak much. And it's only when you give them really a lot of time, they start growing big. And it's, uh, now I mean, I, I wish some theoreticians who are playing with this structure just for a growth point and you start calculating it because it is a, very interesting, but it's also, but uh, you know, it's not our main goal because we, of course, wanting to get a big one so we can put electrodes, and we can see it superconducting, or and then we want to have all possible distribution because we want to start playing with effectively indium being different size creature and seeing how many photons it will take to kill superconductivity, and because then we want to go after seeing photons of our quantum well being emitted under the influence of this semiconductor, a uh, superconductor. So it's a, let me go back to the, so this is kind of, since I jumped over it, so just to refer you the picture, so it's the same chamber, so you have gallium arsenide substrate, so this is our indium, gallium, aluminum, and arsenic. And so the recipe to grow best metallic nanostructure is to close arsenic for up to 12 hours, so you do not want to have any arsenic left whatsoever then have 10 to the minus nine background and grow with the one atomic manga layer per hour deposition rate, which is a pretty crazy growth parameters. Sorry. And it's, uh, sorry. So this is the distribution of the machine I showed you. So this was our, one of the biggest samples. And what's also interesting here is that you start having a rather large separation between the indium islands. So it's about 10 to 20 micron between them. And people in, at Ribert were, were, was laughing that it almost could be another measure of our, how clean is our surface because effectively you have indium I atom traveling 12 nanometer to find, or 20 microns, sorry, to find another guy to stick in. But it's what you give a machine to crazy people. Are they both in the space between those islands completely free of resistance? How well did it? Yeah, it, it's pretty free. We did, I'll show you TM data. So we did a lot of slicing and it's almost at a 0 0.04. It, it clearly looks like they do want to form this kind of a structure. So this was actually when and the transmission peak of this guy is about 8.5 microns. So they really begin to be big. And we even made the, it's the first time in my life I make a post deadline <laughs> into MD conference because usually MD people laugh at us saying, you know, this atomic cavity QED people never can grow anything useful. <laughs> they only do stuff for cavity QED, but this was being accepted finally in molecular beam community of growing metallic islands on top of a semiconductor. 
was a lot of joy. But it's, uh, so this was, uh, so then we decided to grow bigger and see how big island we can grow. So this was uh, 36 <coughs> hour growth and we call it one tank sample because it's effectively we take one tank of liquid nitrogen <laughs> to grow. <laughs> well, and, but we did get 2.3 micron islands and the separation here was about 20 to 30 microns. So it's, so of course then we say, okay, can we grow two tank sample? And we tried. Okay, so this is actually a little bit before I jump into it. One tank sample, this is uh, showing the distance. So we was looking for some kind of correlation. Can, I mean, in French machine, we saw that sometimes they try to align around the edge and form some sort of lines, but we was not able to reproduce it, but this kind of a picture of how our 2.3 micron island look like. So it's about 575 nanometer tall. It's uh, that size and it's, it's pretty much hanging by himself. And it's, yeah, I mean, I <laughs> did find it pretty, pretty amusing, but then we decided to go bigger and went after two tank sample and it didn't work out, probably something did change, but you know, it was like 84 hour growth. So it was and trying to go between the tanks and then we ran out of money because <laughs> it is horribly expensive. And it's also, so the whole thing, I mean, it was curious because the whole thing went berserk. So probably somewhere earlier on. And so, I mean, it's one of the things we do not understand, but this is how TM look like. And if you slightly, so this is, so. So this is the TEM, this is analysis how it's, the surface looks like. I mean, we did a lot of TEM and this is one of the examples. So indeed it's 94% indium. And this is just a touch of indium in the buffer. It's, I mean, it's a point of 04, but it's very, so for all practical purposes, it's indium. So now, obvious next question is, can we make the creature superconducting? Because it is sitting on top of the, yeah, I mean, the original samples was going on top of gallium arsenide. So unfortunately, unfortunately, it's a very easy test to superconductivity. You have to put the golden electrodes and you better see your current drop if you put it in a cryostat. We did have a cryostat uh, which goes to 300 millikelvin from old days of looking at BC of excitons. So we reinstated it. And actually my students learned how to run it and fabricate and put gold electrodes. So we did it and again, a reason why do we want to do it? We wanted to first see the superconducting before we start looking for something interesting in semiconductor under the influence of this uh, superconducting becoming, you know, becoming, I mean, I was talking a lot with BEC people becoming super, you know, becoming a all big coherent state. So we apply the electrodes and we look at the current, we change the temperature, and indeed we saw, I mean, again, this was the very first attempt, but we clearly saw the drop in uh, zero bias resistance. And basically, this is a picture from 61, where people was measuring the indium by itself, and indeed, you know, we have quite a window where it's well behaved. You know, we don't have to go very cold, so our crash had only go to 0.3, so 300 millikelvin, but already at 3.3 .3 Kelvin, we saw the drop and then we did the traditional thing that people do is the differential resistance. And indeed when we have at 10 K, we have a flat line and we see the proper behavior of seeing the tunneling into the creature under the, when we go cold. So now we also collaborate with the group of Wolfram Prunis at Krauss Institute of Technology and they're much, you know, they're much better putting electrodes into the structure. And one of their interests is effectively, you have a small nanostructure which becomes superconducting. It's how many photons it takes to kill it because then you can use it as a detector. So we're collaborating with him as using it as a detector. So he was putting a markers and then he was trying to localize our islands and then he has a nice picture of putting the gold electrodes around it so we can in principle couple, I mean, of course we cannot couple them by gold because gold is not superconducting, but we can 
at least this is the islands in our sample. And we are now getting ready to do interesting stuff with the system. So now what the hell I'm going to do with my indium island, which is superconducting sitting on top of my semiconductor? Yes? It's a very good question. It's the first thing we want to measure, what is the coherent length of our superconducting indium, especially growing on top of indium arsenide. And it's actually one of the things we was, I mean, we was doing this structure is to see, can we measure, can we come up with the electrodes and see you know, what is the coherence length. So it's the first thing we need to know, and how does the coherence length depends on the size, so, you know, my, my island is 2.3 micron, will have, have a bigger coherence length than my indium arsenide, which is my semiconductor, which is supposed to start behaving like a superconductor. And I was just talking, with, you know, it's, uh, in aluminum it's 1.2 micron when it's good, and it's usually 100 nanometer when it's real material. So the question is, what I know is that I will have the cleanest possible indium on top of the cleanest possible indium arsenide because it's all done in one MD chamber. So it will be very interesting to first measure coherence lens before we start doing any optics experiment. But then it, I mean, ideally, it's kind of it's all pain of superconducting people beating us with cavity QED that we usually say, okay, but at least you do not have photons coming out. So now we decided to jump in and be ahead of all the superconducting people doing topological insulators and Majoranas and all of this kind of stuff, saying that we're learning how to get the coherence of superconductivity into photons if it's all possible. And we're starting kind of ahead of you guys because we have a super clean system. We know that our indium arsenide wires and dots do emit light. So now can I now mess up my statistics of my light by making my indium island superconducting? And I just showed you that I did indeed can see superconductivity at 2.3 micron island and my cryostat have an optical window. So I can do both electronic control experiments that it's indeed superconducting. And it's a very nice knob. I can tune the temp temperature of my cryostat. So if I go below three Kelvin, my indium becomes superconducting. And at the same time, I have G2 set up of photons emitted from my super um, semiconductor. And I'm praying that I see a change in photon emission because you know, it's, it's by any chance a coherence gets transferred. So it was several paper. It was theoretical paper by Yuli Nazarov is a crazy guy, oh sorry. I wouldn't call him crazy, but he's absolutely brilliant, nuts. And he is a part of this, I call them uh, Leiden, I mean the Netherland mafia, who is doing superconductivity. <laughs> and I mean, they, they're really very curious, very creative. And they are predicting that in principle, if you put two LED, you know, if you can make two N and P out of superconducting, your semiconductor will emit different. Then it was a physical letter from Schmalian group in Karlsruhe with whom I collaborate and they was predicting that when the Cooper pair recombine, I mean when the Cooper pair influence recombination in semiconductor you're going to get entangled photon and then it's a group of, and then it also was predicted in the quantum well and then it's a group of people in Japan who is putting the electrons Cooper, I mean, basically put in superconducting electrodes, P and N doped, and they do see the change, and it's niobium, and niobium is a pretty barbarically put superconductor, which is put at a very high temperature, and they usually damage the semiconductor, but nevertheless, they do claim that they see change in photoluminescence, and a lot of people questioning their results, but again, the photon statistics was never, was not, method yet. So you know, at this point, it's kind of, it's a lot of dream world speculations of that wonderful different thing may happen with semiconductor if you put superconductor close by to it and you better have a very good interface. And the one of the motivation is saying that the superconductivity is highly contagious. So it is a hope that somehow semiconductor will know that it's a semiconductor, that it's superconductor which sits on top of it. So it's, uh, yeah, this is clearly, 
you know, how, how does one think about superconductors? And I mean, again, here I'm a complete neophyte, so I start reading stuff about superconductivity. And of course, it's a DC, you know, Bardeen Cooper Sheffield <laughs> theory. And you can think that you have two electrons forming Cooper pair interacting by the phonon. And I mean, in principle, I was usually used to think to light matter interaction. And it's, uh, very different here, and in some sense, it maybe help us to avoid thing which killed us with just putting a small metallic nanostructure on top of semiconductor, because there you can stop, you know, you, you need to be between five nanometers to see any coupling, because it's through the field. Here, it's some hope that because of a Cooper pair, you have much larger distances you can interact. At least it could be 100 nanometers, or maybe even micron. And again, this was so far experiments uh, for people doing real superconductivity with electronics with the either the topological insulators or with uh, metal, but it's, you know, the distances are much bigger. And now, how do you think about it? And being Russian and being in half Russian, at least, being spending a lot of time in Karlsruhe, where is a very smart guy, Ustinov, you know, it's a kind of highlight of superconducting people. I begin to start thinking about Andreev reflection and trying to understand what's really happening in a superconductor, normal metal, or in my case, semiconductor interface. You know, how does the semiconductor knowledge get transfer, superconductor knowledge, where you form a Cooper pairs, which is your condensate, condensed state, and then this is where your free particle is. How does the reflect, you know, how does the electron in my normal metal or normal semiconductor knows that it's sitting next to the superconducting surface and start doing, you know, start behaving properly? And one of the really beautiful way to look at and think about it, it's very similar. You know, I'm old enough to did my PhD on phase conjugation in atomic physics in waves, and it's very similar. It's effectively a phase conjugation picture here when the electron from my normal metal or semiconductor starts approaching the surface, it's beginning to become less and less electron. It moves on this quasi-particle, so it's seeing more of this superconducting gap, and effectively to penetrate this region, it needs to have a zero, you know, it need, I mean, here is kind of less electron, and it needs to turn around and become whole and travel back as a whole. So you effectively form a quasi-particle in this region, and this, was beautifully described by Andrei Reflection and people who are doing real superconductivity with kind of real material on this side, looking at electronic property, see a very nice behavior of this quasi-particle dispersion-like. So it's basically it's part of it like electron and part of it whole-like. And this is a structure, you know, this is view of a proximity effect. And again, it's beginning to get understood, but it's not, I mean, it's especially essential for me because I want to emit photons out of this region. You know, I want to understand, can I emit something? Can I change my photon statistics because my superconductor is sitting next to it? So I'm beginning to look at it all possible different ways. And one way, I mean, it's, uh, again, in a superconductor, you have a Cooper pair, which is effectively two electrons. And you do have the, in this region, you have the, quasi-particle, and then, of course, it was very beautiful experiments of seeing, effectively, Andrea bound state, which is formed between two superconductor and to have two phase conjugated mirrors. I mean, so it's very similar, the bound state is very similar to the structure you're going to have if you have two phase conjugated mirrors and have a cavity. And so it's a mode of a cavity, which is round and running out of time. So this was being seen. And this is kind of one of the pictures of uh, trying to see this emission. So at the moment, we're kind of set up in a lab, and our laser broke up at the wrong moment, so we was getting a pump to our femtosecond laser, so we're going to pump with the picosecond light pulse. We have quantum well underneath, so we're going to kill superconductivity first, and then we're going to see if we can have it rebuild and if we can see a change in emission. And this is, of course, now it relates to my Majorana obsession because we, you know, clearly these particles are very much related to Majorana and he is a almost a curious character and we, who kind of started all of this Majorana insanity. And I'm going to show you both in the remaining five minutes very briefly. In some sense, a superconducting semiconductor or topological insulator, people do their one version of Majorana, but then 
the real Majorana, of course, was just solving the Dirac, you know, just finding the solution which Dirac missed, a basically imaginary solution which gives you the particle its own antiparticle. So in some sense, we're, everybody is cheating with their own Majoranas, and it's much easier way to cheat with Majorana if you go, okay, this actually is the one which was observed here, it's electronic, let me skip it, is effectively now go to optical version of Majorana and say that you can write, you know, a lot of it, it started with Kitaya in 2001 when he said, okay, if you have a semiconductor and wire on top of superconductor, you can have a new next generation of gate which may work or at least it will prove many years for people why it will not work, but in the meantime, you can do a very interesting physics and the Hamiltonian which describes this Majorana with the superconducting gap and the transfer integral, you can also have a mimic system which is effectively a zigzag out of metallic structure and do optical equivalent of that. And I'm collaborating with Alexander Padubny, a person from the St. Petersburg who effectively it's a way to calculate the uh, optical equivalent of this very much harder experiment in superconductors and get the photons out of it. And it's basically is a good way to explain it. If you have five disks, you can open the gap. You know, usually you have a transverse mode or longitudinal mode and basically your gap is closed. Sasha did something very smart. It's a zigzag structure, which is basically five metallic disks, or in our case, it will be five pixels, and you can effectively form two edge state, which is mathematically described by the same Hamiltonian as Kitai used to describe his Majorana, and you can see this edge state and explain them in terms of a topological, you know, it's optical equivalent of topological. Of course, you know, you're cheating here as well because you're making it out of bosons because you know, photons are bosons, but of course now our argument is that if we put some nonlinearity, we'll have a little bit more of fermionic nature to it and then it will be more like Majorana. But of course this is much, much easier to observe and it was a, so Sashi experiment was very simple of basically make five metallic disks and see that the light indeed get localized in one of the states and you form optical equivalent of topological insulator and we want to do, we're fixing to actually doing the same thing now, but putting on linearity so we can study the emission of light from this Majorana topological state, and, or we can study its nonlinear behavior. So it's a, and again, this is a, and a, just to give you a little bit of view of the field, it's another thing we're planning to do and doing is uh, it was very nice work of Jeroen Silberberg, which is again opening this gap state and doing a quasi crystal structure with the two periods, again, mimicking topological insulator in optics and forming the gap state. I mean, it's much, much easier experiments. It's cute, it helps one to understand what's happening in the real world, so this kind of optical equivalent of Majoran, and you know, it's in some sense that's where Fibonacci people who was doing quasi-crystal migrated, and we do, you know, we did a lot of quasi-crystals before, so with Sasha Padubny, so that's the area we're moving, and this is a structure we're fixing to we're doing now. Actually, it's a five pixels, and we're going to see a real simple emission, and basically see can we meet, build a coherence of the structure because they're emitting from this topological state. So I guess I should finish. So this is my group. I have five graduate students and a joint postdoc with Jeff Hedrickson, who is now at, AFOSR, at AFRL, and I have the, my collaborators is Martin Begener and Sasha Padubny, Jeff Hedrickson, my former student, and Alexander Arnold is the, my favorite crystal grower cook in France. And this is my funding agency. So thank you very much. <laughs>